<laughs> Great. Um, I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining this meeting of the Madison Food Policy Council. My name is Erica Anderson, and I'm the current chair of the council. Um, the first thing I want to do is have Tanya Anderson from the city's IT department uh, give us some instructions for tonight's meeting. So, Tanya, you have the floor. Thank you. Welcome to our virtual meeting. We are going to cover a few basic items before we begin. To the members of the council and city staff, the chair, clerk, and technical facilitator are responsible for muting and unmuting members. Please be mindful that during any roll call, all panelists will be unmuted until completed, at which time the chair will place panelists back on mute. Voting will be considered unanimous. However, if you object to a unanimous vote, please use the raise hand feature when the chair asks for objections. After clicking participants at the bottom of your screen, you can find the raise hands feature at the bottom of your participants list. Also use the raise hand feature when you'd like to be recognized to speak or ask questions. This includes staff who are being asked a question. The chair will do their best to call on key members in the order in which hands are raised. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. Please wait for the chair to unmute you before speaking. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link or calling the number in your original email. If you are watching the live stream, please mute the stream now. There is a 30 to 40 second delay and the audio will cause feedback when you are unmuted. Members of the public who have registered to speak. When your name is called, the facilitator will find your name matching the name you provided in your registration and permit you to speak. If your name does not match, you will not be permitted to speak. Please wait until you are unmuted to begin talking. The clerk will tell you when your time is up. If you need to share documentation with the council, please send it via email to mfpc at cityofmadison.com. Unless there are questions of you, you will be unable to speak for the remainder of the meeting. In order to keep this quality, we can. If you do not wish to speak, we encourage you to go watch the meeting streamed at cityofmadison.com slash city channel or YouTube with the user city of Madison. Chair, the floor is yours. Um, it looks like we have a question from Lindsay, so I'm going to unmute you now. Sorry, I, I was testing the system. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so seeing no other raised hands, uh, we're going to move on to the roll call. Um, as Tanya said, this is going to work a little bit um, differently via Zoom. So I am going to unmute all the participants at the same time. Um, Nick is going to go down the roster of members. And um, if you are currently with us, uh, please uh, say that you are here or you are present. Okay. I'm going to unmute all. Hi, everyone. Um, um, Chair Erica Anderson. Here. Vice Chair Lindsay Day Farnsworth. Present. Henry Ashour. What's that? What? Henry Ashour. Can we get a hear from Henry? Yes, my dad. <laughs> Henry, it looks like um, you might have muted yourself. So um, in your Zoom window, just go ahead and click the microphone to unmute yourself. Henry Ashour. Yeah. Okay, you're here. <laughs> yes, Steve. Uh, Chris Brockle. Here. Jamie Bugle. Here. And welcome. This is your first meeting. Thanks. Uh, Allison Doff. Here. Jimoke Falomo. Here. Alma Horlock. Was excused tonight. Aaron Kelly. There will be, I, I don't know if this is proper protocol. And Aaron said he was there. Okay. Uh, Alder Rebecca Campbell. Here. 
Jen Lamb. Here. Sarah Larson. Here. Dustin Lunt. Here. Claire Mance. Here. Alder Arvina Martin. Here. Alder Max Prestigiacomo. We have Alder Prestigiacomo. Here. Can you not hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. And welcome to your first meeting as well. Hetty Rudd. Here. Benjamin Rush. Here. Teal Staniforth. Here. Davika Suri. Davika. I just saw your name here. Wait. Davica, do we have you? Yeah. <laughs> see, we, we lost Davika. Uh, moving on. Regina. Like, she's sitting there, she's sitting there waiting. Hey, sorry. It was said I was muted and I couldn't unmute myself. Got it. We're all learning. Uh, Regina Vitiver. Here. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, I am going to go ahead and mute all the participants. Okay. And um, I also. I uh, want to point out that we have in attendance um, Nan Fay, who is the Chair Emerita of the Food Policy Council. Thanks for joining us, Nan. Um, moving on, the next item on our agenda is the approval of minutes. Um, this is in reference to the March 4th uh, minutes from 2020. These were included in Georgia's email. Um, and so what I am going to do now is um, please digitally raise your hand if you would like to make a motion to approve those March 4th minutes. And then I will unmute you so that you can make that motion. Okay, uh, Lindsay, I'm unmuting you. So moved. Thank you. And. Um, do we have a second? Chris, I'm unmuting you. I'll second that. Thank you. Um, are there any additions or corrections to the March 4th minute? Please digitally raise your hand uh, if you have any additions or corrections. I'll give you a few moments to look at that. Seeing no raised hands, um, now in terms of voting, this is what I have to do my best to remember. Um, the vote will be considered a unanimous approval unless someone right now raises their hand, in which case we will go down the roster um, and members will either say yes or no. Um, so if you would like to have a roll call vote, Please virtually raise your hand now. Okay, seeing none, um, we will consider that a unanimous approval of the March minutes. Yes, a successful vote under our belts. Um, next on the agenda, um, we have time for public comment. Um, as to my knowledge, there were no registrants for public comment. Um, George or Nick, do you know anything different than that? I don't think we have anyone for public comment. We do now have one person registered uh, to speak on an agenda item, which I guess if we're following protocol, we will do that when we get there. Um, and it's, um, I guess maybe I can say just, just Duffy Calkins, who is registered to speak on the game up there as the staffer for that. Okay, thank you. Um, so I will call on Jess when we get to that point in the agenda. Okay, moving on um, to disclosures and recusals. Um, we anticipate that this evening's potential action items would pertain to internal functions of the Food Policy Council. 
Um, but saying that, um, please raise your hand if you have any relevant disclosures or recusals. And seeing none, moving on, uh, please raise your hand if you would if you would like to introduce any item of new business. Okay, seeing none, um, we will move on to a special address from our mayor, Rhodes Conway. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as many of you know, Mayor Rhodes Conway is a former member of the Madison Food Policy Council, and um, she's joining us tonight to talk about the city's response to the, response to the pandemic, uh, the relief and recovery framework, and deliver a call to action for the Madison Food Policy Council. Mayor Rhodes Conway, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Anderson, and um, congratulations on making it through the first part of your first virtual meeting. Um, it is an acquired skill for sure. Um, and thanks to everybody on the council for your service. Um, welcome to the new members. Um, I am sorry that you're meeting these people um, virtually for the first time. It's a great group of folks. And um, I know we all look forward to the day when we can be in rooms together again. Um, I want to start out by um, giving you a little background um, on the city's response uh, to the pandemic and then talk more specifically about um, food issues and how I'm hoping that the Food Policy Council um, can be an integral part of our work on relief and recovery. Um, and I, I apologize in advance. Some of you have heard me say some of this before, um, and I, I'm assuming that there are differing levels of awareness around the city's work. Um, so apologies for those of you who know most of this, but I'm, I'm hoping to just set um, set a level on the, the knowledge here. Um, so in the, the biggest picture, the city has been working on the COVID-19 um, pandemic since the end of January, um, before we had our first case here. Uh, Public Health Madison-Dane County was um, tracking the situation and and preparing, um, and we have ramped up um, dramatically since then. The city has opened an emergency operations center um, to deal with our crisis response. We're in the process of standing up a recovery section um, to parallel that um, to think about how we recover, particularly uh, from the economic impacts. Um, but also just looking forward, it's a it's an unusual crisis. Um, most crises that you stand up an emergency operations center for uh, um, happen, and then they're over, and then you can recover. Um, but uh, this this one doesn't operate that way. Um, we expect that this virus will be around for a long time, and and that we may see waves of infections, and so. Um, the crisis uh, doesn't particularly end at uh, any given point. Um, and so we're not waiting to, to think about recovery. We want to start doing that um, right away. And um, so that's that's sort of, uh, you know, the phases that we've been through, right? There's in the initial crisis response that was really focused mostly on public health. Um, and now we're starting to think about um, relief. How do we Take care of our most vulnerable populations, um, and then how do we think about recovery um, for residents, for households, uh, for Madison-based businesses, et cetera? Um, there's a lot more to say there, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, but let me first um, direct you to Public Health Madison Dane County. Um, their website has a wealth of information. The city's front page has a wealth of information about city services. Um, and in particular, uh, public health has a great dashboard with data um, that uh, show our case count um, at, broken down in a number of different ways. It shows um, testing, et cetera. So it's, it's a useful source of information. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I recommend it. Um, I also recommend following them on social media. They put out a lot of good information. Um, I think 
a lot of what people are are thinking about and asking about now is how do we how or when do we start to reopen things and um at the moment that's under the control of the state we'll see what the supreme court does this week um but the way that the county uh, is thinking about it the way that the city is thinking about it uh, via public health is that there are a set of metrics that we're watching um and they have to do with the capacity of our hospitals um in relationship to the number of cases that we have uh, primarily the because there isn't yet a vaccine there isn't a specific treatment uh, there's only symptomatic treatments um the the only tool we have against this virus right now is preventing transmission uh, and so that's what all of this is focused on right it's what staying at home is about it's what washing our hands is about it's what wearing face coverings is about that's all about preventing transmission um and the point of preventing transmission of course is to reduce the number of cases overall and especially to reduce the number of serious cases so we don't overwhelm well our healthcare system so we're watching and um, the capacity of our healthcare system um we're watching our capacity here at the city and particularly in public health to do contact tracing um we're trying to um work with the state to ramp up testing um which is the other sort of key thing that we need to be doing um so we're we're close to having more data to share on these things um but that's really the 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 approach that we're taking is a data driven approach to watch those different elements um and when we feel like they are all in really good shape that's when we can start thinking about uh, reopening more um and i expect um you know based on the data available to me and the the scientific information that i've uh, looked at i expect that we will there will be a dance back and forth here right that we will loosen our restrictions um and then we may have to tighten them again and then we will loosen them again and that that this thing is going to potentially go in waves until we have a vaccine once we have a vaccine that changes the game so um but i just want you to know that that's sort of how the city is thinking about this and that um we will be um sharing more data um shortly so that folks can track that along with us um the other uh, sort of big piece of background information that i want to share with you is on the financial side and um uh, you know the the headline here is really the pandemic changes everything um and that's the theme i think for me tonight um we are uh headed uh, nationally into an economic situation that i think will rival the great depression um and so that just means that um we have to question everything right we have to rethink everything um and we have to think about it um you know really top to bottom what does it mean for individuals what does it mean for households um you know how are people going to survive and meet their basic needs um what does it mean for our small and local businesses what does it mean for our largest employers um you know this is really going to be uh the next i would say 3 to 5 years if not longer are going to be really really difficult economically um for our entire community um and that's part of why um i wanted to be here tonight to talk to all of you because food obviously is one of our basic and essential needs and um i think we have to think now about how we make sure that everybody in Madison can meet that need over the next 5 year say the you know from next month to 5 years out um and we've already seen um you know how this is the pandemic is creating uh, economic and social hardship um uh, for folks in our community um and we've seen how it is disrupting um uh, disrupting supply chains it dis- is disrupting food systems um it's completely changed a lot of things about how people access food um in in some really interesting ways um uh, my partner amy and i are um eating food from restaurants 
way more <laughs> than we ever did before. Um, we're not eating in restaurants, of course, but um, but we're ordering out uh, uh, much more frequently. Um, but you know, I think that that there's there's all these reverberations through the food supply chain um, because so many wholesaler uh, wholesale customers are not accessing those supply chains in the way that they used to. And um, meanwhile, grocery stores are desperately trying to ramp up um, because they're needing to meet more needs and need more staff to do that. Restaurants are trying to pivot. They're working harder to make less money. And, you know, there's, there, there's all these things going on in our food system and, you know, don't even get me started on farmer's markets and community gardens. And, and, you know, there's just a lot of impact here. And we've also seen that the demand for emergency food has dramatically increased. And, and so this is folks that were accessing the emergency food system previously, but it's also a lot of folks who have never used a food pantry before and all of a sudden are in a position where they really need to. Um, so um, we, we think that food insecurity, we know that food insecurity is rising here in Madison. Um, the United Way um, 211 data suggests that it may have tripled um, just based on their call volume. Um, uh, other um, there's other estimates of how much it might increase nationally, um, depending on how long people are out of work, um, and so this is really the this is why why I'm here is because we have this convergence of issues, um, right? We have people who need food, um, you know, and can't afford food, and um, we have businesses that are built around providing food that have a whole new set of needs. We have farmers who would love to be producing food, but can't get it to the people who either want to buy it or need it. Um, and so that's exactly the job then of government is to try and sort this, right? And to try and make connections where there need to be connections and try and Think of systems uh, and implement them to help solve some of these problems. And uh, so, it, as um, the chair mentioned earlier, I was a member of the Food Policy Council once upon a time. Um, I overlapped with some of you, um, and uh, I have a lot of faith in this body um, and your ability um, to to really work well together um, and to think deeply and to get things done. Um, you've, you've done great work. Um, you know, I mean, I don't need to give you the list, but the seed grants and HRAP and the food terminal study and, um, uh, you know, I hesitate to even mention the terrace planting policy because it took us so damn long to do it, but we did it. Um, uh, you know, so there's a lot of good work that's come out of this group. Um, and, um, and I'm, I'm really asking you tonight uh, to help the city meet this challenge. It's a um, this is uh, you know again uh, it's it's obvious and I, I feel a little silly saying it out loud, but um, this we have not seen a challenge of this magnitude in our lifetimes. We have not seen a pandemic like this, and it is it's unprecedented. It's in some ways terrifying, um, but. In other ways, it is really it really calls us um, to to the service that we were already willing to do. It's just that much more essential now. Um, so uh, I think you know that not every city committee is meeting right now. We're trying to work on the training and systems to make it possible for all of them to meet. But I wanted to make sure that this body got stood up because of what I think you can do to meet some of the essential needs in the community. Um, and you will uh, be able to continue meeting on a monthly basis. We're working on making it possible for your work groups to meet as well. Um, and it, the 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 what of of that, the the why of meeting um, is is I think uh, to really wrestle with these bigger issues. Um, 
to to be creative, to be innovative, to rethink systems um, around relief and recovery, um, to connect with the network of um, people who are in the food system already. You all, part of the reason that you're here is you all have um, fantastic connections in the food system. Um, and we're going to need to pull on all of those um, because this is a community uh, based solution that we're going to need to be creating. Um, so you have the ability to develop and recommend ideas and policies and programs and plans that can change the landscape of the food system in Madison going forward. Um, so I'm asking you to lean in, to think deeply. Um, and to recognize that even though this is a tremendous and scary challenge, it's also an opportunity to innovate and change how the components of our local food system operate together. It's an opportunity for us to think about how to create the food system that we want. One that is meeting everybody's needs, one that is equitable, one that ensures access to healthy food. Um, and and meets um, the needs even of those who are not able to afford food in this difficult time. Um, so uh, we have asked, um, we're asking all of you, we're, we've asked Nan to come back and help think about this. Um, George and I have talked at length uh, about what we think is needed. Um, and I know that that you will talk tonight about um, some proposed structures on how to carry this work forward. Um, but I just want to um, highlight that I really do think um, there's an opportunity here um, for you to, um, to have a big impact in our food system. Um, and I think that there's a, a cluster of issues that I would like you to take on. Um, and and so one of those really is around food relief, right? There's there are some immediate needs, um, and there's some opportunity to make connections to meet those needs in ways that that might solve multiple problems. Um, there's also questions about just how do we access the food system during a pandemic, right? Um, what are the things that um, that we need to do or provide guidance to businesses or individuals um, around how to safely get the food um, you know, that they are gonna buy. It's not about providing free food necessarily, but, but how do you safely access food? Um, and what does that mean for people who are SNAP recipients? What does it mean for you know, small grocers or restaurants? Or you know, how do you deal with supply chain disruptions? Are we all gonna have to become vegetarians now because the meat packing plants are closed down. Yes, that's a good idea by the way. I'm a vegetarian. Um sorry, no. Local local meat is fine. <laughs> um but uh you know, I these are I think these are all questions that um you know that are worth wrestling with is you know around how do we safely uh access healthy food. Um and then how do we think about um building even more resilience into our food system? in the long term. Um, and what does that look like, particularly on the economic side um, and thinking about food-based businesses? Um, and then how do we um, strengthen food serenity here? How do we continue the work around urban agriculture and both in terms of uh, an individual household's ability to grow food and meet their own needs, but also in terms of our collective community ability um, to shorten our supply chains um, and make sure that um, we are probably not within the city limits, right, but regionally able to meet our needs uh, around food. Um, so that's, that's my call to action, uh, is that you take on these issues, um, that you take them on in a big way, that you think uh, creatively uh, that you come up with innovative ideas, uh, policies, programs, um, and that uh, you make recommendations to me and to the council and to the community uh, about how we can build a food system that's more equitable and more resilient uh, and healthy 
uh, for our entire community. And I have complete confidence in you. Um, I know you're up to the job. Um, and I really look forward to seeing the ideas that you generate. So thanks again for your service. Um, it's a very difficult time for all of us. I wish I could be in a room with you, um, but I really appreciate you um, sticking with us and um, putting up with the technology um, and figuring out how to work through um, these difficult issues um, in a very difficult time. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Rhodes Conway. Um, would you still be willing to answer a few questions? Okay, great. Um, so if anybody has a question for Mary Rhodes Conway, please virtually raise your hand and I will unmute you. One good thing about saying too much is that then nobody has any questions for you. <laughs> I mean, I, for one, am ready to dive into this conversation. Um, that said, uh, not seeing any hands, um, I am going to uh, keep moving forward with um, uh, framing our discussion tonight. Uh, to do this, we created the framework document that George sent around in the email from last week. Um, hopefully you all have this on hand. Um, this was a collaborative effort between myself, George, Nick, Nan, and Alder Kemble. Um, and in to add to uh, the mayor's call to action, there were a couple things that you'll see on the first page that we wanted to make sure to highlight as we think especially about the working group that will move forward with this task that the mayor has given us. So on page one of the framework document, you'll see assumptions, opportunities, approaches, and timeline and scale. Um, and so I want to just um, touch, bri touch briefly on these. Uh, especially for the audience who may not necessarily have this document in front of them. Um, so in terms of assumptions, first of all, the Madison Food Policy Council is well positioned to do this work. As the mayor said, we represent and have connections to local government, institutions, and community groups within, um, within our area. And uh, traditionally, the Food Policy Council has taken a bird's eye view of many different types of food system needs. Secondly, we can prioritize strategies that the city has control over, some of which we've talked about in the past, like growing produce on city-owned lands or repurposing city funds for food programs, such as the Healthy Retail Access Program or the Seed Grant. Lastly, we can use tools like the Racial Equity and Social Justice Tool or the Sustainability and Resilience Tools um, that the city of Madison is currently using to accomplish goals like maximizing community engagement and evaluating the effectiveness of the policies, programs, and plans that we come up with. Uh, moving on to opportunities. Um, this crisis has obviously created many challenges, but as we move forward with these relief and resilience efforts, there will be opportunities to, like the mayor said, identify programs that meet multiple needs and find ways to improve the local food system in the medium and long term. Um, if anybody would like to add to that opportunities, um, I know uh, Nick has had um, some very inspiring thoughts. I don't know if you would like to um, jump in at this time or not. Uh, sh sure, um, I would just add that the opportunities in front of us are um, really unique in, in time. Um, the federal government is um, changing the way that programs that we're familiar with operate. There is lots of legislation flying around at many different levels. 
And all of that presents um, opportunities for us to really think about not being wedded to the way things have been in terms of how our food system operates. So the, the long-term um, goals that we have may be uh, on the table for the first time at realistically in a long time. Thank you for that. Um, Hedy, I see that you have raised your hand. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I just wanted to acknowledge, um, because Nick spoke, it just made me think of how important this is. Um, you know, just brainstorming even at our, at our, at our shop, um, having the public health piece, um, you don't think about it until, you know, you think about your plan and then boom, then you're hit with weight. Can we even do this, um, you know, in a, in a public health, um, way, in a way that keeps people safe. So, um, I, I think this is fantastic. I'm excited. Great. Thank you, Hetty. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute you again. Thank you. Um, so moving on down the document, uh, we have listed some potential approaches. Um, things that we especially want to think about are identifying opportunities to collaborate, to support community partners. Obviously, there are a lot of different um, organizations and institutions that have already pivoted efforts towards food systems especially food system relief in the community. And uh, also to maximize the effectiveness of city resources. Um, and uh, I thank the, the city staff uh, in advance, like George and Nick, um, for all the hard work that we're gonna do to understand what are the city resources that we can connect with. Um, lastly, in terms of timeline and scale we have on here, could the city stand up a relief program by June 1st? Um, many of you would be familiar with the um, United Way and Boys and Girls Club effort that has already given out grants to nonprofits in the community. Um, that was a point of conversation for us as we were putting together this document. Um, we also want to consider how and whether to engage county and regional partners for immediate and longer term collaboration. And I just want to add in there that, um, as we all know, um, as the mayor stated, uh, emergency food need is has already been on the rise at a magnitude that we haven't seen in a long time. And so moving quickly is a priority, especially as we tackle that relief and food access piece. Um, I am wondering at this point if... Um, anybody has any questions or if the people who helped in the formation of this document uh, have anything to add, um, you can virtually raise your hand or unmute yourself at this point. Okay, um, moving on. Uh, you'll see at the end of page one, we have listed the current work groups um, I'm going to read those off for the benefit of our audience. Um, so under normal circumstances, these are the work groups that um, are part of the Food Policy Council, community engagement, food waste and recovery, healthy retail access, healthy marketing and procurement, pollinator protection, and integrated pest management policy review task force, seed grants, and urban agriculture. We also have regular business reports from community gardens, IPM Policy Review Task Force, Dane County Food Council, MMSD, the school district, public health, and the public market. So as we move forward, we don't necessarily want to completely eliminate um, the structures or the expertise has been, that has already been built through the Food Policy Council. And um, there are things such as uh, seed grants or the Healthy Retail Access Program that uh, will presumably continue, although may have a change in focus. And so as we launch into this discussion about where we go um, with future work groups, especially, it's important to think about um, which should continue, which might um, change direction, but retain their um, original members or add new members. 
or which could be wrapped into a um, newly proposed work group um, to continue on with some of the, um, the projects that have already been underway. Um, as you can see on the document there, uh, we did put some asterisks by the ones that we initially thought could continue to um, support the pandemic response work, whether continuing as is or at, on an ad hoc basis. So now turning to page two, um, this is going to be the main basis for our discussion this evening. Um, so as you can see, and as the mayor stated, um, we came up with four potential future work groups um, following the mayor's stated priorities on food relief, pandemic food access, food recovery and resilience, and urban agriculture and food sovereignty. So I would say that our goal for this evening is to discuss these as potential work groups, discuss potential activities, understanding that what we are trying to leave with tonight is a structure for moving forward, not necessarily a complete plan. We are hoping that we will get enough ideas in detail tonight so that people can volunteer to be involved with the groups that they are most interested in and have the capacity to participate in. And from there, those groups will flesh out scope, details, equity considerations, evaluation. But for tonight, what we really want to do is decide the structure of how we're going to move forward. Um, so, George, I don't know if you want to um, jump in here in terms of sort of how to move forward with this discussion. Yeah, good thing. Thanks. So, as Erica and the mayor alluded to, you know, we have this kind of core group that uh, have been meeting over the last couple of weeks to put together this kind of working draft framework of, of what the Food Policy Council structure moving forward under and immediately after COVID, you know, what, like, what does that look like, right? Um, and so I think one of the things to keep in mind is when we're looking back at what our, you know, quote unquote, old work groups were, they were very topical in nature. Right. You know, we had again, we had urban, we had urban agriculture, we had uh, healthy marketing and procurement, food waste, so on and so forth. And so I think what we're kind of moving more into, or at least suggesting, and this is obviously open for discussion, and I would welcome folks to jump in and raise your hand framework of, of what the, you know, say your thoughts on this, is that we're moving more into the categories that can entail a number of different topics. Right. So we have things like food relief, pandemic food access, future food recovery and resilience urban ag and food sovereignty. Many of these things can entail a lot of different topics underneath, right? So food relief and pandemic food access, for example, could have um, food recovery housed under each of them. It could talk about healthy procurement. You know, it could talk about a lot of different things. Um, it's just a way to categorize our thoughts to think about how we're serving the community in kind of the short term, short and immediate term, mid long term. And so, you know, we, we as, as Erica, said, we spent a lot of time actually thinking about this, but, but it's by no means perfect. Um, we think, and, and again, based on what the mayor said in terms of what the priority should be on how we are serving the community and thinking about these issues, this is kind of where our brains in terms of how do, we, how do we categorize this out in a way that's manageable from a work group structure and being able to meet uh, and on, on an ongoing basis to talk about refining the work of each of these work groups. But we really wanted to have this conversation with the group to decide, is this, is this kind of the, is this the right way to go? Is this what the structure would look like? And I don't think we necessarily want to leave here with, with all the answers on every single thing that these work groups are working on. We want to leave here with a, a blueprint and a framework on how we can move forward. And then, you know, one of the beautiful things about the Food Policy Council, and I think a lot of actually other groups and, and other staff and uh, BCCs, uh, boards, committees, and commissions are, are seeing is that the work group structure is a nimble and flexible structure. It is a great way to actually get stuff done if you're only meeting in um, an authorized meeting once a month, right? We've done, I think, a great job with our you know, seven previous work groups of being able to get stuff done between our meetings and then coming back with recommendations, ideas, you know, programmatic 
um, ideas, things like that. And so I think we're in a similar position to be able to continue to use our work group structure to get things done um, in kind of the age of COVID. So, you know, I don't necessarily know if I can set more context than is already there. It's kind of in front of you on black and white, or in black and white, but I would, and we would all welcome um, feedback on, on what we proposed and what your thoughts are on how we move forward. Um, so if you um, have any comments, questions, suggestions, um, again, raise your hands. I will unmute you. And then for the purposes of discussion, we might leave several people unmuted at the same time if there are questions or follow-up comments on that. Teddy, uh, I see your hand raised, so I'm going to unmute you. Uh, yeah, I hate to be hogging up the conversation, but we got work to do, folks. So, And um, I'm stuck in this house. So I can't take it anymore. Anyway, um, one th there's been a lot of um, things that come have come up in the context of my day where we're thinking about things that need to happen, but I don't know who... Um, like who answers the question, so to speak. So I'm excited because I think that maybe we can be that clearinghouse. At the same time, I know that in a way that's what George does, but who wants to bother George all day, every day? Um, <laughs> and I'm also seeing, I'm really excited as well because we're a school that houses a neighborhood center at Badger Rock. And because our building isn't going to be being used for its intended purpose, I've been trying to figure out, well, what can we use it for? So. Um, you know, no, as I'm sitting here looking at this, I'm like, oh, Dustin's on this call from MSD. Like, I, I've sat next to him in meetings and never had a thought of what we would have in common until today. And now I have so many questions. So I'm really excited um, and hope that we can start to connect the dots here um, because there's so, there's so many opportunities. Um, so I'm excited. Thank you, Hattie. I think you um, provide a really important perspective there um, coming from Badger Rock, a community center, a school, um, an institution with a robust gardening program. Um, I'm curious if you, um, if you look at the groups that we've proposed, food mm -hmm. relief, pandemic food access, food recovery and resilience, urban agriculture, um, in talking about sort of your, your clearinghouse, idea for groups reaching out do you see a place on that list where that sort of activity fit the um i think the maybe the food relief as far as mapping the system um i i know that there's other people on this call too like chris and um others but like knowing what people's um areas of expertise are and maybe what they you know so I know feed has um, a lot of access in terms of um, kitchen space and things like that. We do too, to a certain degree, um, maybe not as much as they do, but um, just knowing like, who, you know, if people had a place where they could go um, that had those, you know, answers as far as what resources are still available, what's not, who, you know, who, do we just, who are the public health people that we can go to, to to help us figure out, are we being safe? Um, you know, things along those lines, like who, you know, as we're starting to create this new infrastructure, um, I know we've been thinking about, um, you know, we've kind of just pivoted and, and, you know, we have Troy Farm on one end, Badger Rock on another, which is a small, smaller scale. Um, but now we're looking at summer coming. And I know that um, there's been some, uh, um, effort by the school district to get food to families during the school year, but that's going to end midsummer. So, you know, we're there. How can we help? I don't know that we can do it to the extent that the school district has, but, but maybe we can, if there's other people that, you know, that can help us. And so, you know, I've, I've been playing around when I, when I take this, I, my idea to my boss, she's like, what are you doing? That's a lot of work are you sure you can do it? I'm like, uh, I don't know, but 
but then I sit here and I look at all of you and I'm like, we could do this guys. Come on, let's do it. So, you know, I'm sure there's gotta be a way. Teal's laughing. Cause she knows. <laughs> And then that includes other players too, like CAC, Second Harvest. Like, how do we, you know, we have an informal relationship now with CAC that's been fantastic, but how do we make that more formal and how do we get, um, I don't know. Yeah, thank so you. A lot of connecting of the dots. Yeah, I I share your optimism. I think, I think a lot of us do. Um, Sarah, I see that you have your hand raised. So I'm going to um, mute Hetty and unmute Sarah. Uh, you should be unmuted. Oh, so go ahead. Yes. Hi, I'm unmuted. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks. I just wanted to say, yeah, I was really excited to see the call for the meeting today and to see this document. And I think that um, this re this kind of revamping of the work groups um, really resonates with me. I think this is a really good way to help give us some structure for responding. And I'm glad we're having this conversation. Um, and when I looked at it, I didn't, I didn't see any really strong gaps that came to mind because I feel like a lot of things come into that, our expertise within these groups, creating those one pagers that like start to get at solutions and tactics and what we can do within them. Um, and as he Hedy was saying, like we have a lot of that expertise and a lot of people are working within this COVID environment with these different partners. And so I think we have a lot of innovative solutions that we're seeing and things that we can pull together within this framework. Um, and I know there's a lot of funding available right now that is like deadlines are coming up in May, in early June, in July. And so I think um, kind of Figuring out, yeah, those like next steps to, um, I guess, kind of start to work through this process and then see what we, how we need to respond or come up with. Um, yeah, I think it's, I'm glad that we're doing this. And I guess my reaction is this does resonate. I thought the document was great um, and a good start. And I'm excited to kind of get into how we um, take those next steps to work towards um, helping out the community in these ways. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I think you you raise a really good point about um, keeping track of those deadlines because to me that funding piece really plays into those those opportunities that we want to pursue both short and long term. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute you. Um, I see Alder Prestigiacomo has raised their hand. I'm going to unmute you. Everyone, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm having some technical difficulties. Um, also, pronounced Presta Giacomo. I'll just say that right now. Um, so, I, no worries <laughs> if you mispronounce it; it happens all the time. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm really looking forward to this. This document was great. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing how we can incentivize sustainable agriculture and food systems. Um, I, I think you know we have a, a crisis on our hands, but you know, like. We heard the mayor said, we're going to be looking long-term. We're going to be looking how we can um, really revisit these systems. And I hope that we um, take the time now to really look in how we can ensure that there's no you know, negative impacts uh, long-term um, on sustainable practices. Um, and then another thing I'm, you know, I'd, I'd, I'm really hoping to get involved in is <clears throat> the undocumented community in Madison. Um, you know, I've, I've spent actually the past couple of weeks going through food pantry requirements and um, looking at um, specifically what communities can access there. And I'm, you know, I'm hoping that we can really factor that in this decision. And um, because there are a lot of communities, you know, suffering right now and marginalized communities in particular. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to working with you all. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. And I'm hoping that um, by using uh, especially the racial equity and social justice tool that we can really parse out the different needs of um, specific communities or specific neighborhoods or whatever it may be in Madison. So thank you for reminding us of that. Uh, Lindsay, I see you have your hand raised, so I'm going to unmute you. 
So I agree. Thanks for putting this document together. Definitely think it's um, it resonates and um, it's always good to have a clarity of purpose, especially under circumstances like these, but, but I think also in general. Um, I immediately go to thinking about operationalization and maybe you guys have already thought about that, in which case um, I, I'll defer to you. But I, I was thinking just you know, one potential strategy would just be to have folks sort of self-organize into the group that off hand they seem to connect to the most. And then um, like an asset-based approach might look like before those groups, those working groups, those preliminary working groups, let's call them, convene, everybody can kind of identify either what they're doing or questions they have or things they've observed in that space. And then using those documents like the equity lens or the that casting tool um, kind of zero in on what the highest you know leverage strategies might be based on some of those assets. And then our working groups, I think, have always been most effective when we pull in um, key partners that aren't necessarily represented on the Food Policy Council into the equation. And I think having a little bit more clarity around what at least initial you know one to three priorities per group are, it, it uh, gives us clearer talking points in terms of like who to reach out to um, and who the other natural partners might be. And then in this process, maybe there's some reshuffling, you know, maybe somebody who initially identified with the pandemic food access really finds that they belong more in the food relief group based on the direction that that group takes. And that's fine. That's part of sort of the developmental process. So um, I think the other thing that I would add is because I'm involved with the HRAP group um, and that was identified as one of the groups that might um, might continue to serve a function, and I, I certainly see a role for it. I actually see us both in sort of the pandemic food access it, as well as the resilience piece with some of the work that we've been advancing around a pop-up terminal market that could actually um, move, move towards a longer-term uh, terminal market solution. And that's really important both from a food security and access perspective, but also from a small food business development perspective. So I would urge any group to look sort of both up and downstream. What are things that we need to do in the next you know, three to six months or a year, but how can that work be foundational? Um, and sometimes it won't be. Sometimes it's about getting people food for their next meal. And that's that's totally appropriate. But sometimes the way that we approach that can actually be foundation lane. And I would just encourage us to not think so strictly in terms of immediate term, you know, versus resilience, but about the integration of the two. And maybe that goes without saying, but I was just thinking about how that might look in the context of a project that I'm involved. Um, and that's my piece. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. I think you bring up a lot of really important points there. I'm going to go ahead and um, mute you. Um, two things that I want to highlight. One, I think the point that you made about bringing in partners who are not currently on the Food Policy Council is really, really important to this work going forward and something that I want everybody to keep in mind, especially as we sort of self-sort into groups and think about the work going forward. Um, the other piece you brought up about HRAP um, made me think about the status of some of our funding sources. And um, I sort of cued George a little bit earlier. Um, George, maybe this is a good time to talk a little bit about the status of past, present, and future HRAP funding. Sure thing. And I don't want to speak too definitively. As the mayor said, everything is very uncertain at this point, especially moving forward. But the way that we understand things, and probably most people recall this who have been on the Food Policy Council for any amount of time, is that um, so earlier, in years past, we had built up this kind of uh, repository of funding for the Healthy Retail Access Program, which um, in recent years we have been able to actually um, utilize on, on pretty high quality products or projects, I think. Um, Luna's Grocery, Feed Kitchen, uh, Madison Oriental Market, um, the ACDS study for the food term, right? So we, we've been able to kind of spend money on things that are pretty instrumental from a food systems perspective in our community. Um, however, from the fiscal year 18 funds, there is still a remainder um, around 112,000. And one of the things that we talked about was, and actually you can, you can kind of see it, I believe, in the logistics component of the, the second page of the framework. That would be. But historically, right, the, the HRAP, the Healthy Retail Access Program money was, it was HRAP money, specifically for the Healthy Retail Access Program um, and for the things that that program supported. 
I think because of the situation, the very unique and challenging situation that we're in, we can revisit how that funding is actually utilized. And so one of the things that, you know, I want to kind of, I don't know if caution is maybe too strong of a word, but put on people's radar is that we, we don't necessarily just want to be in a position where we're spending money, right? There, as many people mentioned, there's a lot of money and resources flowing to address this issue, right? To, to address issues that are rising up because of COVID, right? I think what we want to do is obviously understanding that there are immediate needs. We want to be able to meet those needs in, a, in an intelligent and efficient way, but also understand, you know, and get a good grasp of what those issues are so that we can do that. So the idea of trying to understand what our community, you know, our most pressing community um, issues are, as well as what are we going to need to kind of uh, build up resiliency for the mid and long term is going to be really important. And these different work groups can, you know, dig deeply into that information, work with community residents, community organizations, um, dig into the data, do the mapping, do, you know, do the analysis to figure out what the needs are, and then come up with recommendations from the work group to the full food policy council to actually push forward implementation of those ideas, potentially utilizing the, the remainder funds from the HRAP program. So it's almost like we're kind of lift, to some extent we're looking at ways to restrict or to take the restrictions off of the healthy retail access program to be able to support um, food systems ideas and you know, relief ideas, recovery ideas under COVID. Um, Again, nothing is set in stone, so I don't I don't want to say what I say here. You know, take it with a grain of salt because nothing is concrete. But there there is one hundred and fifty thousand dollars that was set forward for um, the healthy retail access program budget twenty twenty. Now, as many of you know, there have been conversations that have been going on and that you know carried over from last year into this year to actually look at how do we how do we increase um, food access you know, food retail um, outlets within our city. And so those conversations still continue. And if at all possible, it would be great if we could use the current year funding in a way that aligns with the program. Now, again, I'm not saying that we have to because if pressing needs emerge and, and we're able to, to verify that and we see what those are, you know, we can have conversations around how that funding is used. But this is one of the reasons that we kind of put an asterisk by the Healthy Retail Access Program work group because that work continues, right? Like, and, and probably now even more than ever, there, there is a need to have more of these um, access points within the community. So all of this is to say that we have this current pot of money. I think it's in a very flexible position right now. And as we, as a food policy council and our associated work groups get to work on, you know, how can we assess needs within the community and then what recommendations do we, need, do we make to meet those needs? We do have some resources at our disposal internally, and I think we could um, use that to also then leverage external funding sources to meet that, right? So um, I, I, if, if there are specific questions on this, I'm happy to answer them, but that's kind of the, the context I wanted to provide to some of the funding sources we have. Thanks, George. Um, Chris, I see that you have your hand raised, so I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Thank you, Erica. Um, well, Hattie called me out, so I figured I better speak at some point. <laughs> um, so a couple comments. I, I really look forward to diving into this as well. I think that uh, the time has come and maybe the opportunity presented by the pandemic is to really shake things up um, and really dig down and do some stuff. The thing I see missing most from, from the list that we have here is um, food system workers. Um, so we've certainly seen, um, you know, since the pandemic started, uh, essential workers and food system workers, whether they be restaurant workers, grocery store workers, farm workers, um, the injustice that they face and how they, uh, being our lowest paid people, are the most important people that we have in our society right now, right? Getting us our food. Um, so definitely, I think we need to think about how, what we can do for food workers. Um, and social justice on, on their behalf. Um, I see sort of, uh, I think the big opportunity here is, for me, is collaboration, right? I have had so many discussions since the beginning of March, end of February, when this was starting about how we can do things. And I've talked to different people in different parts of the food system. Sometimes we worked out a collaboration, sometimes we didn't, but we were always looking for ways of trying to do something different. 
think as we work through this stuff, we have to think sometimes we're going to lead. Sometimes we got to follow, right? Because there are people throughout the food system. We aren't the first people thinking, oh my God, this is going to change. We better, we better start thinking about it. Everybody who's working in the food system has been thinking about it since this happened, right? This is not going to be normal. And the, fur- and the further we get into it, the more we all realize that the way we do business is going to be very different. So there are things, there are discussions happening way outside of uh, our purview and, and our control. And I think we need to be prepared to hear what those things are and sometimes follow and be prepared to support those. Um, and then sometimes be prepared to lead and, and suggest new things. Um, I think if I look at the food access piece, I don't want to forget our food carts and our mobile vendors um, who are basically grounded right now and they're suffering and they have no idea what to do. And there's a a pivot point that's coming, but they don't even know what that pivot point is. And we can't even advise them what that pivot point um, might be. And so folks may not even go into business this year um, or just mothball it and i don't know if they return uh, for future years or not um the other things on my mind are so the big thing i think is coming i think the, the number one thing we have to figure out right now is the food relief piece that's happening and a lot of money going in you know march 19th free kitchen started doing community meals we've been doing it now but what is it eight weeks or whatever it's starting to feel like factory work here um but we have jobs and we're getting food out, so it feels good. Um, but I think there needs to be an assessment of, it says here, map the emergency food system in any gaps. I would change that to map emergency response um, in any gaps because well, we certainly know food systems and there are people who know the food system and where the food pantries are. Um, but there's been quite a response and there's been a lot of people that have been Jumping into the emergency response, including feed kitchens, um, making meals um, that haven't been here before. And what are they doing? And where is that going? And how long are they going to be doing it? And what are the you know where are, where are people not getting served? So my worry, as we all do this, and I see it on the news almost every night, somebody new doing something, is are we you know are we directing resources all to the right places, right? Or are we over resourcing some places and under resourcing other places? Can, we can disperse community meals at a at a site and people show up and they get meals, but what about the people who are shut in or anyone identifying those truly isolated folk? So to me, that's the pivot. The other piece so of that pivot comes is there's been some great funding going on. The Boys and Girls Club got us started. United Way is bridging that for a little for a little longer, but eventually that money's going to run out, right? And then what happens? Is there going to be more money or do we pivot back then to the traditional System that's not going to be traditional because they're going to have a different way of, of doing business. Um, and so, to me, you know, figuring out at what happens as we pivot here. I mean, here at Feed, uh, we took a huge hit in April. We had almost no commercial revenue at all. I mean, if it wasn't for the food feed the meal program, we probably would have had to shutter the place. But that kept us going, and now we're into May. We're only on what was the date today? May six. May six. I'm already six days into May and I've already equaled almost the revenue that I got in April. So people are trickling back. As people trickle back, does that affect our ability to, to supply the community with meals and for how long? You know, we got to make space for people to run a commercial business and make money as well. Um, and what does that look like? It's, it's hard for us to even know, you know, when, when is that going to happen? You know, when is the big crush of commercial businesses coming here and what does that mean for us and how does that look? And, you know, it's our problem to figure out how what we do with the facility and keep it safe. And we're certainly working on that. See, those are the things to think about. Now, I think I've talked too long already, so I'll shut up. Not at all, Chris. Thank you so much for <laughs> um, jumping in there. And actually, three hands went up while you were talking. So I'm going to mute you, but might have to unmute you if people want to have some more back and forth with you. Um, so, Jen, I believe your hand went up first, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, thank you. Let me know if there's feedback. Sorry if there is. But something that I've noticed is um, there are a lot of smaller organizations, especially I live on the west side, and um, I'm involved in some smaller organizations over here. 
and they're not food related at all, but they definitely work with this underserved community that needs access to food. Um, there are people who work on the ground. They're sometimes very small organizations. And right now they're kind of like, all right, so maybe we had a strategic mission and a way we were doing things, but right now there's no money for us going forward. And, but they still want to help and they still want to find a way to serve their community. And some of them are like, all right, people need to be fed, but they're not quite sure what they need to do. So for me, I go back to, it sounds like community engagement in my head when I, as we keep talking about community. It's these groups out there that are small that want to help. Um, like I know of a group on the West side that's trying, that was trying to form COVID happened. And now they're like, all right, what can we do for our community? So finding those groups who are not currently food related, who want to help and who would be excellent resources because they are on the ground and they know things like how kids are getting their food. Um, in some cases, they're stealing it. It depends on what's going on. So I think having that sort of network partnership and maybe someone would talk about, you know, having someone on food policy council who represents a group, having someone who maybe isn't directly food related, but who knows the ground and is working with that population in other ways um, would be great. So, but yeah, in particular, I do know of a group that was like, okay, we're going to try to do something. And then I was like, oh, no, but we still want to do something. So finding ways to help those smaller groups that want to be a part of things that just don't know and may not even know about Food Policy Council, but they have bodies, they have volunteers, they're ready to go all in and roll up their sleeves, but they're like, I don't know what I'm doing. So that was just like the one thing in my head because it does go into how do we get food to people, but also it comes back to how do we learn what's actually happening on the ground and what the barriers are day to day for groups. I think that's all I have. Thank you, Jen. I think that's a really valuable contribution and um, something that um, I want to reiterate is that as we think about these work groups, um, people who are not members of the Food Policy Council can participate. And so um, that might be a potential opportunity to bring in some of the folks who you're referring to. Um, and I see that your hand is raised. Um, so I am going to unmute you. Hey, okay, thanks. Uh, good to see everybody's faces. I think one of the themes that have been coming out of everyone's conversation is the network and mapping. So like the first bullet point is saying mapping the emergency food system. And I think it'd be worthwhile to really map the resources and connections that we all have on the Food Policy Council. So we've been, you know, I've been like, Part of this group for about a year and i know what some people do but i have no idea how far our networks really extend and if we are trying to map the emergency food system or perhaps a whole food system in general it would be nice to be able to connect the dots for who knows what and who can go to what as well for reference so if we have this backbone of all of our individual strengths and the people that we know it might be a good way to help sort who goes into each group. And as the groups go forward and start making ideas and where they need to go next, have a quick reference point for who might know uh, where to get volunteers, where to do some data analysis, um, or you know, specific with like food banks or something like that. So I, I feel like that would be a worthwhile homework assignment for all of us to do uh, to help us quickly figure out what we have covered with the context that we have here on the council and also see where we might be somewhat weak and where we need to uh, put in more community help as well. Thank you for that, Ben. I think that ties in really nicely to what Lindsay was saying about using the strength-based approach to um, kind of kick off the formation of each of these work groups. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute you now. And then, Lindsay, I see that your hand is raised, so I'm going to unmute you. Thanks. Um, yeah, so actually, one, to respond to Ben, um, totally agree. And I still think that it, it will be ultimately more constructive if we get people to identify you know, who their networks are or their assets or however we, we want to describe it, both in terms of 
relationships, but also projects underway um, or possible grant proposals that are out there, grant funding opportunities. I mean, assets fall under a bunch of different categories. But if we organize those around issues, I think if it's just broadly like what what context do people on the Food Policy Council have, I think we're going to miss things. Um, but to have sort of a focusing question or, or issue, I think will ultimately be a little bit more, um, help us advance in some of those new work group categories. And, you know, the focusing question or issue could be constructed in any number of ways, or it could just be organized by those four, four bins that, that um, the leadership group took. And then the other piece is just to respond to Chris, and, um, and that's that uh, Megan Blakehorst and uh, my colleague at Extension, Erin Piat, I actually adapted some resources that came out of the Wisconsin Restaurant Association for food part vendors. Um, and, and they worked with SBDC and um, a number of other partners. And it's been translated to Spanish and distributed to DATCAP's uh, statewide list of um, food cart vendors. And then um, a number of the different um, chambers of commerce, uh, both in the Madison area and, and beyond. And so I know that those resources they're imperfect and the needs keep changing as the landscape keeps changing, but there has been some development in that space. And so um, I'd love to get your feedback on that. If there are particular gaps in that resource or if it hasn't come across um, feeds desk yet, uh, you know, cause I know that you guys are closely connected with food trucks. So under other circumstances, I would have just chatted the resource out and then been like, Chris, let's talk. But um, I had to raise my hand, so I'm sorry. I'm just getting used to this open meetings format of Zoom. That's it. Lindsay, I'm actually going to leave you on, and then I'm also going to unmute Chris. Well, Lindsay, yes, we have seen the, the document and have shared it widely, and it's been that's fantastic. And it was really helpful, especially in the um, sort of early times of COVID when people just didn't know, right? It seemed like every time you made a decision an hour later, that decision was the wrong one and you had to change it, right? And that was happening for a couple of weeks. Um, so definitely and operationally, that document is extremely helpful. Um, what I'm talking about really is, is it even worth going out on the street? Is there going to be business there? Is it, are there going to be events? Is, is it going to be worth my time? Am I going to be able to buy ingredients? Am I, those are the questions really that, people are facing now. I think they understand that, yeah, I could go out to the square. And if I actually see somebody or, you know, people walking around the square, maybe, uh, maybe I'll give it a try. But, um, you know, at what point during the season do they just say, you know, it just isn't worth it anymore to, to ramp this up. I'll go, I'll go do a different job. I'll go Uber for, for this season and um, try again next year and, and hopefully I can make it. Um, so those are the questions that people are, and of course, as we face, we have we have plans that we put food carts into, and we try to fit seventeen food carts into this facility. And, and under the new conditions, that just well, our plans are shot in the butt because they would have started already in April, uh, um, and there's just no way we're going to fit seventeen food carts in here. So we're kind of balance. You know, what is your mode of operation, you know, are you cooking on the car or are you cooking in the kitchen? Are you going to events or are you going out every day? Are you going out at night or are you going out for lunch? How does that fit in with everything else? And I think ultimately we're going to be in a position where you know, we can't choose everybody. There's going to be a few people that are in, how do we make that? I don't even know, right? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. All, all good questions to um, to hopefully resume in the, either the resilient uh, right. bin or, and or the pandemic food access right. bin. But I I just want you to know that there are definitely others of us that are like really invested in the small food business piece. So I'd love to right. pick up this conversation in yes. some capacity. Thank you, Lindsay. Great. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to uh, mute you both. Oops. Okay. Um, that brings up a question that I have um, in talking about the way that, for example, um, food carts specifically could fit into multiple of these work group bins, food relief or food access or recovery and resilience. Um, I think it's important to consider how we not um, duplicate efforts in these work groups or um, how we how we tackle how we tackle something topical 
like that um, coordinated in a coordinated way, in a productive way, um, and in an efficient way. So maybe I can jump in here. I mean, that's it's a good point. I think it ties back to something I touched on earlier where it was, you know, these are to some extent topical work groups as proposed, but really they're they're topical but kind of overlaid on on timeline, right? So like there's there's food relief, which is really kind of like how can we do stuff now? Like how how can we solve issues that are emerging now? So if, I think if you get kind of common themes that are emerging between the different work groups, like say food cards, um, you know, one group focused on food relief um, or pandemic food access could talk about what's happening right now to support food cards and also support residents. Whereas if you talked about food cards under the future recovery and resilience group, it would be like, what is, you know, what does the landscape look like for food cards two years from now, three years from now, five years from now, and what, what things could we recommend or look into to make that environment um, conducive to their viability, right? So, so I think, you know, I think we could potentially, and, and I think the, the thing that's going to be useful is for us to be able to share what each of the work groups is doing. Um, because if the if food relief work group knows that the food recovery and resilience work group is talking about, you know, they're both talking about food cards, but in a slightly different way, you could try to align those conversations to, to some extent. So I don't, I don't necessarily think that it, um, it takes off the table, you know, talking about, you know, the same, maybe the same user group, the same demographic, because the, the work groups are going to talk about them in slightly different ways. But I think that's a really good point is that we have to understand that, you know, moving in, you know, if, if we get to, a, if everyone's kind of in agreement that these general work groups are comprehensive in what they cover, it, they're going to cover a lot more ground than our old. And so we need to be kind of strategic in, in how we prioritize that work. And I think, I think Lindsay touched on that in her earlier comments is like, how do we prioritize then the things that we're going to try to tackle and recommend through these different uh, If I could jump in on top of what George just said, I think each of the work groups will be asked to do the scoping document that's been prepared and, um, you know, whoever identif is identified as a lead of that work group and is facilitating those conversations can use that document going forward to really frame the scope of that conversation and when things are getting you know, the, the nature of this conversation is very much um, uh, deeply rooted in a lot of different sectors and there'll be, there'll, there'll be overlap and there'll be, it'll be hard to avoid that entirely. Um, but to a degree that we can like reference back to our scope and where, where our frame of reference is in each conversation, I think that'll be beneficial and lead us well into our monthly um, Food Policy Council meeting. Sarah, I see you have your hand up, so I'm going to unmute you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, back to kind of, I like this discussion to really great, back to kind of, I guess, this, the question of like kind of how we operationalize this and move forward. What are sort of next steps? And I partly ask, because I don't know the mechanism to say I have to leave a little early um, since there's not a chat, but I might have to cut out a little bit early, but also very curious about kind of this next steps um, phase for this, because I think it's, it's yeah important to dig in great point let's right like let's get to it <laughs> um so i think you know to erica's earlier point right i don't think we're going to leave here with every single answer determined in terms of what each work group is specifically working on i think there are some suggestions within the framework i think what we do want to leave here with is a motion to accept the recommendations on the work group uh, again obviously um, unless there's some pushback against that. Um, to your point and Lindsay's earlier point about operationalizing the work groups and what does that look like? One of the things that um, kind of our, guess our planning team talked about this meeting was, I think we want to create the space for folks to declare what they're interested in, but we don't necessarily want to put everyone on the spot to have to make that decision right now, right? Like, especially with, what, with everything that's going on, you know, people have, you know, very new and different uh, concerns around Childcare and you know occupational demands and things like that, and so we want to be able to give folks the space to think about number one, what are you interested in, and then number two, do you have the bandwidth to actually engage on that issue? 
So I think what we can do is obviously if folks are ready to kind of commit now, we will we'll take that feedback and record that in a minute. But I think um, I'm going to follow up with the flow group and just send an email um, asking what folks are interested in, um, potentially maybe some probing questions around who, who else should be involved. Um, and so I think that's probably the way we'll do it. Um, but again, I, you know, one of the things we want to do is that we didn't want to unilaterally decide that this framework was going to be the way that the Food Policy Council, you know, works in this, in this revamp structure. We wanted to have a conversation like this and it's actually been a great discussion, but I do, and so I do think we want to leave with at least some kind of formalized motion that puts on the record that folks are cool with, with this work group structure unless they're not cool. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to unmute you again. I was going to say, you can go to Nan first if she raised. I was just going to make the motion. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Nan, I will jump over to you. Sarah, I'm going to mute you. Okay, Nan, you're unmuted. I was just going to suggest that um, in the as people are thinking about what where they might want to fit into um, to these these proposed work groups, uh, the leadership team could maybe think about um, operationalizing uh, the idea of um, mapping the networks that are um, you know that are available in the Food Policy Council. And uh, my thought was maybe with a little help from Lindsay, who's really good at this, um, coming up with a document that we could circulate to people that would everybody would you know sort of be answering a similar set of questions so it'd be easy to compare one to the other, see where the overlaps are. Um, that might be a tool that would be helpful um, after after this meeting to sort of provide some structure for the actual um, populating of the work groups that might help people think about where would I fit best. Um, so I think I would just propose that that be something maybe that the leadership uh, team discuss at a, at our next meeting for sure. Um, Nan, I'm going to leave your mic on and I'm going to unmute Lindsay. Um, I would just say that it would be easy enough to put together um, a Qualtrics survey that both gauged what people's interests were topically and captured some other information about their networks and otherwise. So I'd, I'd be happy to work with the leadership group. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Lindsay. Okay, I'm gonna mute you and I'm also going to mute Nan. Um, Hedy, I see that your hand is raised. I'm gonna unmute you. Um, I'm just thinking when that survey or, or whatever document goes out, maybe if we could also indicate if there's other people or organizations that we think should be a part of, because I can think of people on my team at Rooted that would be great um, to be a part of this work. Yeah, I think that's a really good point and a, and a good addition and something that we want to really integrate in this work moving forward. Um, so just, gonna... as a, just as a point of order, I just want to jump in because I know, Lindsay, you mentioned Qualtrics. I think if um, I think if we can just come up with the base questions, the city has a survey monkey account. So, you know, because it would be great to just keep this on file and be able to have a record to look back uh, on that's under that. Um, so I've been I guess actually the, the pro, you know, we don't have to get on into the weeds on this, but the process has kind of changed on what SurveyMonkey looks like. But that SurveyMonkey is the tool that we use. So I think if we can just develop the base questions, we can feed it into the, you know, the, the software. Um, ben, I'm going to unmute you. I'll just quickly say too, if you want any help designing the questionnaire or uh, need some feedback on it, I love that kind of stuff. So you just let me know. I'll be happy to help. It's your passion, man. Yeah, you know. Thank you, Ben. We appreciate that. Chris, I'm going to unmute you. 
Well, I'm going to have a hard time picking which group to belong to because they all look to me. But, uh, we'll figure that out. Sarah, I'm sorry. I walked away. I thought you were going to be gone for a while. So I'm, I'm going to make a motion that based on the uh, setting of the food system to the COVID pandemic, that the Medicine Food Policy Council uh, adopts the new work group structure that's been put together um, by the, what are you guys, leadership team core group of planners. Um, there you go. How's that for a motion? That makes sense to me. Um, do we have a second for that motion? Sarah, I see you've raised your hand. I'm going to unmute you. Raise my hand real quick so I could second Chris. <laughs> I second. All right. Thank you. I'm going to mute you. And um, please uh, virtually raise your hand if there is any additional discussion about this motion. Okay, seeing no hands, um, again, we're going to go through with this um, different voting process. So um, if you would like to have a roll call vote um, for any reason, please virtually raise your hand now. Otherwise, if nobody raises their hand, we will consider it a uh, unanimous approval. Okay, seeing no hands, um, we will consider that a uh, unanimous vote in favor of um, the motion to move forward with the work group structure outlined in the framework document. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you for those who have contributed to this discussion. Um, we still have some regular business reports on our agenda. Um, so we will go through those and um, I will do my best to call on the right people. Oh, hang on. Okay, I see a hand first from Chris, so I'm gonna unmute you. And now that we took the vote, just a quick question. on uh, Some of this is gonna be fast moving and it's beginning of May now and <laughs> be June quickly but we don't really know how we're going to meet um, or what kind of schedule that would be on or how, how we're going to get together. So how is that going to happen or what is the plan for things getting us on the tracks and up to speed quickly? I can, I can jump. I think um, when, when I do the follow-up email to the group to figure out, you know, who wants to be on what similar to how we've done last time. And especially now with actually a smaller number of groups, I think we, we set up, um, at the least a monthly meeting schedule so that we can, um, you know, we can have a, a space and a hell of time to, to talk and discuss. One of the things that we've been looking into and we've been talking actually with Tanya um, Anderson and IT a bit about, and also with the city attorney is about how can we meet, how, how can we adhere to the flexibility of our old work group, you know, um, structure in this new virtual meeting world. Um, and I, I think we have gotten some clarity now from the city attorney's office and, and um, so we're working with IT to figure out how to set that up. Um, it, it is looking promising. So I think we'll we'll be able to kind of adhere to the flexibility we've had in the past to be able to, to hold these meetings without necessarily having, you know, the huge built infrastructure that we see here for IT to have to facilitate and do all of these different things. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't want to skirt around the issue of what you're getting at, though. I, I mean, our goal is to try to convene these groups as quickly as possible. Um, like you said, it's, you know, the week of the fourth now, three weeks from now will be in June and the needs of the community aren't abating, right? Like we need to, we need to be putting something together so that we can actually move forward quickly. So that, that's kind of the goal and is kind of a top priority of staff. Chris, does that answer your question? Can I mute sure you does. now? Thank you, All right, thank you. Um, Nan, I saw that your hand had been raised. Do you still want to weigh in? Um, I'll unmute you. 
Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we touched base on the some of the issues that are listed in the logistics portion of the um, of the framework document at the bottom of the page, just in case uh, before we moved on to reports. But um, some of that was obviously taken care of, and um, I think George addressed how he's going to communicate with the group about this. Yes. Um, would you like me to read those out, Nan, just uh, for the benefit of our audience? Yeah, you've, been, you've done a good job of doing that for folks who are, are zooming in from uh, may not have the documents, so it's probably a good idea. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Nan. I'm going to mute you now. Um, so for everyone's benefit, um, I'm going to read through some of the logistics conversation or logistics um, points that the leadership team had talked about in regards to especially these work group meetings. Um, so work groups will set their own meeting schedule. Um, members and chairs may need training on the city's virtual meeting system, um, like George mentioned, especially so that we make sure it's compliant. Um, Food Policy Council staff will need to notice all the meetings and ensure that the agendas and minutes are posted. Um, we've had some discussions, especially about making sure to take more detailed minutes from these meetings so that um, the public has uh, enough content to react to. Um, each work group will develop a one page purpose and scope document. This is um, similar to what we've asked uh, work groups to do in the past uh, in regards to their formation. Um, each work group can propose repurposing Healthy retail access program funding to meet emerging needs. This is what George alluded to earlier in reference to especially the fiscal year 2018 funds. Um, all work groups will utilize equity and sustainability tools to analyze proposals or policies. And um, of course, there are plenty of other logistics. Kind of, um, I don't know what word I'm searching for and not finding. Logistics considerations. Um, that will emerge going forward. Um, so that completes the the framework document. Um, so we will uh, continue to refer to this going forward and uh, and of course add to it, such as in the case of the logistics considerations. Um, so that said, um, Unless anyone else raises their hand, I think we are ready to move on to the regular business report. Um, so the first on that list is community gardens. Um, so George, I believe you give that update. I do. And um, I mean, if others want to raise their hand and jump in, we may have pertinent updates. Feel free to. Um, try to keep this short. I'm just looking through some of the notes that Nicholas um, read from rooted put together. So I think it was mentioned maybe at the last um, Food Policy Council meeting we had on the fourth, or it might have been mentioned prior to that one. Um, I am, the city I should say, is working with Rooted to look at a pilot on providing a couple of thousand dollars, you know, not, not a lot, um, but a, a bit of money to help fund um, lower income gardens on um, water affordability and accessibility. So it's been talked about, um, especially through the Urban Ag Work Group and then you know, convey to the full food policy council that there are discrepancies among, um, fortunately, I should say, around what uh, certain gardens are charged for water. Um, and, and that in some cases, a lot of the smaller gardens that are lower income and thus collect um, lower amounts of annual plot fees are hit with a proportionally higher water bill than larger gardens and more affluent gardens. And this really affects their ability to to really do anything other than just pay the bill. And in some cases they can't even pay the bill. And so one of the things we're trying to do is work with Rooted um, and, and Nicholas has done some great analysis on um, the disparities across actual payments of gardens. And so we're providing um, a couple thousand dollars in funding to really try to level that playing field so that gardens who have historically um, spent all of their money or even you know had to rely on other sources to pay their water bills now will presumably have some extra money to be able to do things like, you know, look into programming or other things that actually put the community in community garden. Obviously this is all 
a little bit up in the air in terms of the, the programming aspect because of COVID-19, but um, this pilot program is going to be really interesting in terms of, and, and maybe we'll have to do more robust um, analysis and research when times are more or less normal. But we're really trying to look at what the impact of that could have on, on gardens who have historically been really unable to do much else other than pay their bills. That's that's one update. Um, around COVID-19 specifically, um, so Rooted has, you know, developed in, in conjunction with public health guidelines, some pointers or guidelines of their own for community gardeners. Um, there's also um, materials that have come down from Department of Health Services at the state level around the safety measures and um, kind of best practices around, you know, no, no workshops, no event days, no shared pools, um, washing your hands, things like that. So, so just being able to educate gardeners on the fact that you obviously can still garden, um, but the, the environment has obviously changed because of COVID-19 and what are some of the best practices to follow. Um, I think those are kind of the big ones for now. Um, like I said, if, if other folks who are involved with community gardens work in the city have, have anything else to add, feel free to, to raise your hand. Heidi, I'm going to unmute you. I just want to say thank you, George, um, for your work um, along with the Rooted staff. And just to say the the demand um, has been pretty, pretty um, considerable. I know at Badger Rock, we um, work on a little bit more of a donation-based system. Um, and we have probably tripled or, yeah, tripled our, our community garden space um, and went from just raised beds to in the ground beds um, to support folks need to get into the gardens and to grow food um, for them, their families. And there, there are a couple groups that are doing it a, as a group to do, um, to ensure that there's access in their communities. So um, it's definitely a, a big, a groundswell <laughs> of um, interest in gardening. Thank you, Hattie. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute you. Um, so uh, the next business report on our list is the Dane County Food Council. So I'm going to go over to Jess. And uh, Jess, you are now permitted to talk. So if you're still on the line, um, okay. go ahead. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, so, hi, my name is Jess Guffey Calkins. I'm a um, community food systems educator at Extension Dane County and staff of the Dane County Food Council. Um, and so not a huge update, but um, I was glad to, you know, I've been in conversations with George and Nick, um, several people, and Lindsay, to kind of talk about things that are happening with the two councils. And so basically, similar to the Madison Council, the Dane County Food Council meetings have been postponed. We haven't been meeting um, due to the county state of emergency. And we are, we have recently gotten the, the go ahead to resume meetings so uh, in the in remote version, um, much like tonight. So we're looking at likely the um, May 27th, which is our, our typical fourth Wednesday of the month date. Um, and similarly looking to meet with the primary purpose of addressing county food system needs and issues related to COVID. Um, so we are still kind of working that through. Um, and then the other just thing that I wanted to mention is that the um, the PI grants the, um, that are similar to the C grants, that press release hasn't quite gone out yet. Um, so I, I won't get too ahead of that, but just to say that those, those awardees have been determined. And so $25,000 um, is being allocated to 11 different awardees. Um, but that information will be coming out in a press release from the Office of Equity and Inclusion, I would say probably within the next week. Great, thank you, Jess. Um, I am going to mute you um, because I don't see any questions that have come up. Thank you so much for that update and good work on the pie grants. Um, okay, 
Moving on, uh, food policy director update. Yeah, so I'll try to keep this relevant. Um, so obviously all of you are familiar, most of you are familiar with the work that ACDS um, LLC out of Maryland is doing on the terminal market um, feasibility study. So because of COVID-19, uh, institutional partners, Extension, CIAS, Public Health, ACDS and the C have been working on looking at how we could um, stand up a pop-up terminal in the interim. So something that could meet, you know, kind of immediate needs looking at refrigerated trucks, looking at, um, you know, warehouse space around the city in the greater Madison area. And I've actually started putting in um, external funding requests for that. So submitting grant requests, things like that. Um, that's moving forward. We actually were, we had a call today. Where, so we're hard at work on some USDA grants and some other proposals. And it's, it's interesting because the work right was really set up around a feasibility study, which was, uh, I guess, kind of a theoretical exercise, like, will this thing work? Um, and a lot of the, re the research that was done by ACDS pointed to there being strong demand and um, feasibility to actually do something like this. And now, obviously, with the, the challenges that are being presented uh, because of COVID-19, one thing I keep saying, I sound like a broken record when I said this, but it's almost served as kind of a situational catalyst to that issue. It's, it's kind of pushed the need for such a facility or for infrastructure that helps meets um, the needs of aggregation, um, distribution, um, and, and storage forward. And so now we're in a position where we're actually putting in grant requests to, to try to implement some of those ideas. Um, so, so that's moving forward. I uh, hope to keep updating you all at our monthly meetings and obviously hope to have good news in kind of the preceding months about that. So um, tying similarly into what Jess provided as an update on Pi Grants, seed grants were approved um, last month by the Common Council. Um, and so right now I'm working with Natasha Holmes in the mayor's office to do the contracting. It's all digital contract routing now. So technically it's faster, but it's, it's a new process. So we're trying to get used to it. Um, $50,000, obviously, um, which is our annual allocation for the seed grants, uh, was dispersed to 13 grants this year. So it's notable to kind of um, see the number of grants we gave. I think last year we kind of took a, a deeper versus broader approach. And this year, just because of the sheer need um, and, and because of what people were asking, it was a lot easier to parse out funds to, to serve some of their immediate needs. And so we took, a, I guess we took a broader versus deeper um, approach this year just to try to help meet as many needs as we could. Um, I kind of gave my update on the work group structure in terms of, um, you know, Chris had a good question on like, how, how are we going to meet? When are we going to meet? And so again, continuing to work with IT in the city attorney's office to figure out the best way to do that to uh, preserve our flexibility, nimbleness, and kind of all the things that make work groups great and not subcommittees. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're, we're continuing to look into that. Um, we'll have an answer by the next meeting um, for sure. And then, um, and Nick can touch on this maybe in his update as well. Nick and myself have been convening these weekly food access and distribution stakeholders calls. So calls. So we've been having um, representatives from um, Dane County food pantries, uh, the two food banks that serve Dane County, um, you know, nutritional services from different school districts that, uh, you know, obviously MMSD, but then some of the neighboring communities, and then community-based organizations who are engaged on food access and distribution. And those calls have been actually really helpful. Um, we've gotten, we have, you know, we have a Google Doc that has all the minutes. We have a Google Doc that has all the contacts. And there's probably about 60 contacts on that list. And we've, we've gotten pretty, we've gotten pretty steady participation since the beginning of around 25 people and entities being represented on those calls who can share thoughts, share ideas. Um, and a lot of, a lot of what we've been able to do has resulted in kind of offline work. So the connections being made in that, in that realm have led to partnerships outside of that to be able to actually you know, partner up, collaborate, and do things. Um, additionally, just to offer more concrete um, resources to the folks that are looped into that group, um, Jess, Claire, myself, and Nick have started putting together these bi-weekly bi digests of resources that are useful to kind of emergency food system, food access, and distribution stakeholders. Um, and so we'll continue to do that um, to, 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 again, be kind of a useful forum for folks. Then the last thing I want to touch on is at a national level, right? Like we're obviously here in, in Madison, it's in Dane County, and we're trying to figure out what does all this stuff look like? How can we tackle some of these issues within our, 
our locality. But one of the things that's uh, really interesting is to see what other communities are doing. So Nick and myself are linked up with the U.S. Conference of Mayors Food Policy Advisors Group. They're having weekly meetings to talk about best practices and kind of topical issues around what other cities are doing. So it's been really interesting to hear, for example, what, like, what is Baltimore doing um, with all this? What is New York City doing? Um, and a lot of these places are a lot bigger than us, have a lot more money than us, but also have, on a scale perspective, probably a lot bigger problems than we do. Um, and so to see how they're kind of trying to tackle them and deal with them is informative to and will be informative to how we do our work here. So um, those are those are my updates. Again, um, we'll probably continue uh, more or less these some of these common themes in my updates in months to come. And again, on some of the things we're seeking funding for, I hope to have uh, good news on. Thank you, George. Um, next, we have uh, the, the Madison Metropolitan School District. So, um, Dustin, I'm going to unmute you. All right. So we have been uh, providing meals um, out to the families and students uh, here in the city of Madison for uh, we're in our eighth week now. Uh, we are averaging over 18,000 meals uh, for the week. Uh, so we are doing okay. Uh, uh, we, we continue to have uh, groups and um, different people reaching out to us to help us identify the, the pockets of need and, and help uh, kind of coordinate the uh, meal distribution. Uh, we are at 14 sites currently uh, throughout the city. And actually tomorrow we're going to be adding a 15th site at uh, Mendota Elementary School. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, I know we will be um, serving meals uh, basically now um, until August. Uh, traditionally, uh, school is going to be ending uh, June 10th here for the uh, Madison School District. And, um, you know, we've made the decision that we're going to be feeding straight through. Uh, we don't know what our you know, summer school program is going to look like yet. Uh, the administration hasn't uh, released that information to us yet. Uh, hopefully soon we'll have that and for the next meeting, but I would anticipate us uh, serving meals uh, through early to mid-August um, at a minimum, uh, kind of depending on how things unfold here uh, throughout the summer. Um, you know, we've also uh, tried to take advantage of, of some of the funds and grants that have uh, become available. So we've applied for a number of grants to kind of help us with, um, you know, marketing and outreach and supplies, food, et cetera. So uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. Thank you, Dustin. And thank you for all the hard work that you've put in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute you. Um, next on the list, we have public health everyone. Um, it has been an interesting time to work in public health. <laughs> uh, I appreciated Hetty's uh, comments at the start. Uh, in many ways, I think all of us are now in public health, and even those of us who were working there um, in food access, uh, you know, my work has shifted into realms of uh, public health work that I, I didn't, um, I wasn't exposed to prior to this. So it's been, it's been fascinating. It's been stimulating. Um, it's been interesting to see the response from the inside, and I can certainly share uh, more about that as we move forward. Um, it's obviously tragic. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot, you're seeing a lot of suffering and struggling from families uh, in real time. And so I think the context of this conversation that we've had tonight is really um, is well taken, and especially for my role. Um, just a little insight into how we've kind of structured our response. Um, while we were previously organized in four divisions, in the face of the emergency, we've restructured in an incident command structure. So there's new uh, organizational uh, hierarchy within the department that includes uh, an operational response that's involved in our testing and tracing efforts. Our, um, you may find somebody who'd be isolated through health orders under that section. Um, there's planning and, and how do we engage with our staff and, and not just within our department, but staff who may be underutilized in other departments based on workloads and work from home and engaging them and, and involving them in our response. 
Um, and then there's a, a liaison team, which is what my work is now involved with. So different liaisons operating with different sectors of the community, um, food access, um, homeless and housing, um, healthcare sector, uh, and a whole host of other different kind of groups that are um, being being formed and, and conversations that are being led by different members of the department. Um, in, in many ways, what we've kind of been doing all along has prepared us well to have some of the conversations that we've been doing in public health around food. Um, I, I know that George and I have felt very well prepared to jump into these partnerships in, in large part because of our relationships with this Food Policy Council, Dane County, and some of the work that we're aware that you all have been involved in all along. So I just wanted to again say, uh, you know, the, the networks we've created are, are real and, and to kind of echo the comment that knowing what each other is involved in and um, how our work can be inventoried, I think will be really a valuable exercise in, in terms of understanding the reach and scope of our, of our work. Um, lastly, I, I think, uh, you know, Hetty made the other, another comment that who, who can we go to for public health questions? Um, for, all, for all of you, I would love to offer myself. I'm at your disposal. Uh, I can be that public health liaison to this, to this body as well as um, just to the department. If you have general questions, you know, our department has been tasking us with being experts in coronavirus response. And that may mean that you have questions for me that I can't answer directly, but I might know how to get an answer for you um, or that you have a direct line to somebody that knows a little bit more about what's happening locally. So with all that said, I think there's a couple things I would just uh, provide some updates on. George mentioned our work with the uh, food access and distribution stakeholders. Uh, I've been working on some of the tracking of federal legislation, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, and some of the uh, impacts of that on SNAP and, and WIC and some other programs, TFAP. They've seen a lot of different elements of our federal nutrition program network that have seen uh, new changes uh, in recent weeks. And, and rapidly, and I expect that to be there to be further uh, work in that area. The one of the issues that I updated this group about uh, frequently in the past is the public charge uh, uh, issue, the, the public charge rule change that occurred uh, last fall. And I think at our last meeting in February, I mentioned that the public charge, or excuse me, in early March, uh, our, the public charge rule had gone into effect in late February. There has been national effort to appeal that decision to reinstate an injunction. Our department, the public health department, has submitted declarations in support of that that have already gone before the U.S. Supreme Court and are now going before district courts in Illinois and New York. So I'm hopeful that there will be updates in that regard that we can at least count uh, on undocumented members of our community and, and folks who are seeking to become permanent legal residents of the United States that they can use the benefits of SNAP and Medicaid and housing assistance uh, in this uncertain time. And then finally, a little bit of discussion tonight about the uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court ruling and decision-making process. We're watching that very closely. Uh, for those who s observed the, the hearings uh, earlier this week, it, you know, I think we can expect that things will be our partisan, that it's a challenging um, environment for the governor to be in, and defending his order and, and this, the Secretary of, of Health to defend that order in face of the uh, objections that were posed. What I can say and what I've had, uh, I asked our health director, General Heinrich, if I, can, if I can communicate this to partners is that regardless of what happens with that health order at the state, at the state Supreme Court, there will be health orders in Dane County that, rep, that kind of modeled after Safer at Home after that point, if whether you know, if we see a reversal of Safer at Home, there will be something in Dane County close to that um, direction for the for the short term, and that would happen um, unless there's some sort of preemption kind of passed by the state legislature. So that you know, and I know there, there's a lot of questions about what happens next and where <clears throat> businesses are allowed to reopen and how things are allowed to move forward, but hopefully that does allow some forward planning, some thinking that we're not gonna have to, to scramble, at least locally, into undoing some of the hard work and sacrifice that's already been made. 
so that's that's plenty of of communication now. I, I'm happy to reach out to folks if you have again if you have questions about public health work and the response specifically, just let me know. Shoot me an email, and I'm happy to work with you directly. And that can be things you know about COVID or uh, kind of the food system work more generally. Thank you, Nick, and thanks for continuing to be a resource for all of us. Um, I, I think we're so lucky to have you so involved with this body. Um, uh, the last business report update is on the Public Market Development Committee. So, um, Lindsay, I'm going to unmute you. Great. Um, so the PMDC has not met since um, the COVID outbreak, but um, we were really at a point where a lot of the work was already kind of happening with the city anyway, and it was really more about navigating permitting processes. So the city's moving forward with MSR on the construction documents and on the April 29th, UDC approved the design features um, on the consent agenda. So um, that work progresses. And then earlier today, um, George and uh, others and I were on a call with um, ACDS, the consulting group that worked on the terminal market feasibility study along with Ann Reynolds, who uh, heads the Fa Madison Public Market Foundation, and Amanda White, one of the lead fundraisers for um, the public market project, exploring pursuing a USDA regional food systems partnership grant between the two projects. So linking that terminal market component to the more public facing um, public market. And, and it looks like we'll get some traction there, hopefully. So um, that's that update. That's really exciting. Thank you, Lindsay. I'm going to mute you now. Um, let's see. The last item on our agenda is our future meeting schedule, both in terms of work groups and the Food Policy Council. Um, George said a little bit about this earlier, but you just want to reiterate those points, George. Yeah, sure thing. So, I mean, we're going to, I, th I think actually we could explore it when I send the, the email around the work group schedule, but um, considering the attendance that we had tonight. <laughs> um, I think we could probably keep our standing time. Uh, obviously it's kind of set in people's heads, it's on your agenda. Um, and so presumably we would keep the first Wednesdays of the month at 5.30 to, to hold our, our meetings. Um, one of the things that was actually discussed is could we potentially do them earlier, right? Like instead of 5.30, could we move it up even? So I think, you know, I think we, there are some things we can explore. Um, in that regard, but it's not, I don't think it's incredibly pressing again, especially considering the, the really stellar attendance that we had. Um, and then on the work group side of things, that's something that's kind of going to be determined and figured out, especially we have to stand the work groups themselves up first and figure out who's on them. And then um, how folks schedules actually um, line up with how those groups can meet. So I think that's work that'll happen between now and the next meeting. And we'll have updates on um, a standing meeting schedule for the work group themselves. Uh, amongst other things at that. Great, thank you. Um, so with that, one thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, the mayor had to leave this meeting uh, earlier on, but she wanted to pass along her thanks for everybody's continued service and um, and commitment to this work. So. Um, I think we we all echo that and are excited to to move forward. Um, I don't see any further raised hands. So with that, uh, is there anyone who would like to make a motion to adjourn? Uh, Regina, I'm going to unmute you so you can make the motion. I move to adjourn. Thank you. And I'm going to mute you. And then, Chris, I see your hand, so I'm going to unmute you. I'll second that motion. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to mute you. And um, with that, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for attending this meeting. And uh, we are adjourned.